It's a very exciting new aircraft for future pilots of the Indian Air Force that's just been unveiled and announced by Hindustan Aeronautics Limited. What does it look like? Well, that's what it looks like. But what is the reality of it? When will it come online? And what are the big questions surrounding such a complicated project? Remember, in the political sphere, HAL has been painted as a company that is beleaguered. It has been politically cheated. But the company is shining and they've put out this new project that we're going to detail first and exclusive here on India Today. Thanks for tuning in. This is Five Live. The headlines as always first. City of Nawabs turns into a business hub as Lucknow hosts Global Business Elite. Prime Minister inaugurates UP Global Business Summit, praises UP business model. Agar aaj dunia ke liye bright spot hai, the UP Bharat ke growth ko drive karne wala ek ahem Controversial statement by Telangana BJP chief Bandi Sanjay says will demolish domes of secretariat because they reflect Nizam culture. Big embarrassment for Ashok Gehlot government in Rajasthan Assembly reads out the previous year's budget by mistake. Opposition cries shame, shame. ISRO's mini vehicle soars into space as India launches the next generation SSLV D2 rocket carrying three satellites into orbit. This was the second test after the first one failed last year. Huge congratulations to ISRO. Business Today TV quizzes LIC on Adani. LIC boss gives a big assurance says will ensure investments are safe. Always a very exciting day, especially for aviation buffs and those who track the military when they see a new military aircraft. And this one's called the HLFT-42. It's completely indigenous. It is proposed to be made in India and it claims to be a game changer as far as training and preparing pilots for every future scenario possible in addition to saving huge current costs on training incurred by the Indian Air Force. Take a look as we unveil the HLFT-42 made in India. Big boost to self-reliance in military aviation. Hindustan Aeronautics Limited today unveiled first images of a brand new supersonic fighter trainer aircraft intended to train future pilots for frontline combat. Called HLFT-42, the new trainer is currently in the works and a prototype will be ready soon. A full-scale model of the jet will be unveiled at the Aero India show in Bengaluru next week. Aviation buffs and experts are abuzz over the new fighter trainer revealed in just these few images released today. The high-performance platform incorporates an ultra-modern cockpit and a full complement of combat sensors, weapons and operational capabilities. With the new HAL jet trainer, pilot trainees get to not only experience supersonic flight but are exposed to a very fighter-like environment before actually graduating to frontline fighters. The new trainer will allow the Air Force to fill a tiny but crucial gap in its exhaustive pilot training regimen. What's more, in a war-like scenario, the HAL trainers can be quickly weaponized as light tactical fighters if the need arises. Best of all, it's a fully indigenous solution to a present and future problem that will only increase. Currently, fighter pilots go supersonic only on frontline fighter jets like the MiG-21 or Su-30. With Shivarur in Delhi, Bureau Report, India Today. So let's tell you a little bit about this new aircraft that's been proposed. It's only in the concept stage right now. It's being proposed to the Indian Air Force. Now, if the Indian Air Force chooses to get it, this is the kind of capability that it will receive. It's a supersonic jet trainer aircraft. Uh, an absolute, uh, you know, uh, uh, necessity as far as training is concerned because this is an aircraft that can go supersonic. HAL claims that it will be fitted with advanced sensors and an advanced cockpit. It will also have, uh, you know, give pilot the full fighter feel 
uh, in addition to supersonic speeds, which is crucial for modern, uh, you know, combat missions that will happen as, uh, you know, uh, through this. It will train pilots in advanced combat because this will basically have all modern sensors, all modern equipment and avionics to give pilots what they will experience when they're in an actual advanced frontline fighter. But very crucially, it will save the high costs that the Indian Air Force currently incurs by training many of its pilots on actual frontline fighter aircraft. So instead of spending all that money on the MiG 21s and MiG 29s and Su 30s, they're saying, why don't you train on something that is cheaper to build and to operate? It's indigenous, it will be made in India if the Indian Air Force green lights this program. It's still early to tell whether the Indian Air Force will approve and show solidarity with this program. Now, let me just quickly, for, our, for the benefit of all of our viewers everywhere, to tell you what the Indian Air Force's training regimen looks like. It's a multi-stage training that takes place uh, in the Indian Air Force. It starts with stage one, which is a propeller training uh, currently that takes place on the PC-12, the Pilatus PC-12. These are Swiss aircraft. They're going to soon be replaced by uh, HAL's HTT-40 aircraft. But these are the planes that currently are the first rung of training for all Indian Air Force pilots. Then they go to stage two. They go to the HJT-16 Kiran aircraft, there are very few left right now that are training pilots, very few left, they will soon be out of service. So that intermediate jet training is called stage through. And finally in stage three, you've got the Hawk, advanced jet trainers. These are British built aircraft, HAL also constructs them and uh, 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 that's where pilots go. Crucially, these aircraft do not fly supersonic. And therefore, there's a stage four, which is operational fighter training, where trainee pilots go from the Hawk into frontline fighters like the MiG-21, Su-30, etc., where they conduct training flights on actual fighters. So, what HAL is proposing with this new aircraft is an intermediate step, a 3.5 stage, where it has this new HLFT fighter trainer, which basically has all the qualities of a fighter. It can travel supersonic. It's capable of uh, simulating a real fighter environment and cockpit, but does not cost at all as much as operating a fighter but can still travel supersonic. So all of these different uh, uh, issues are there, which will become a part of the Indian Air Force's training regimen should the Indian Air Force decide to do that. I want to quickly also just uh, put the spotlight on something that's coming up. It's a big, big week and a big month for Indian military aviation. They see military aviation as it were, because you've got HAL unveiling this uh, very promising combat fighter trainer today. Just a couple of days ago, you had India's very own Made in India LCA, light combat aircraft, landing on India's very own aircraft carrier, INS Vikrant. And on the last image on your screen, that is the Tapas surveillance drone system that has been manufactured and developed here in India. And as it happens, it will have its first public flight and showing next week in Bengaluru at the Indian Aero India exhibition. So lots of uh, muscle flexing and lots of things to be proud about as far as Indian military aviation is concerned. But there are big questions as far as this flashy new fighter is concerned. Remember, obviously, this doesn't uh, look real. These are concept images of what the aircraft will look like if it turns out to be real. But there are big questions that we must ask because many experts, including some former chiefs, are also asking. Question number one, how much will it actually improve pilot training? That is beyond doubt. If it delivers on the capabilities it claims to, this will be a game changer and a huge cost saver as far as pilot training is concerned. Number two, will the Indian Air Force support this aircraft program? Super crucial. The Indian Air Force hasn't always shown solidarity with programs of HAL and for good reason sometimes. So will the Indian Air Force embrace the HAL FT-42 is a big question. Number three, doesn't HAL already have its plate full with other aircraft programs like the light combat aircraft, including the Mark I, the Mark II. There are future aircraft like the Ted BF for the Navy that are also supposed to come online. What about all those platforms? Does HAL have its plate full? You know, does HAL have the bandwidth to keep a new, a, a, a one more fighter uh, aircraft program coming online? Does it have the bandwidth to do it? And finally, number five, Asking all these questions is fine, but will the cost-saving benefits, the cost-saving benefits be too good to resist? And will that finally be the game-changer that persuades the Indian Air Force that this is something they should put their entire strength behind? So those are the big questions we're asking at this point of time. Now, 
I told you just a short moment ago that it has been an incredible week as far as Indian aviation is concerned. Uh, just a few days ago, you had the Prime Minister in Bengaluru, near Bengaluru, as a matter of fact, unveiling the first light utility helicopter from HAL Stable, designed, developed and built for the Indian Army. Now, this helicopter is going to be handed over to the Indian Army next week and it is another reason to celebrate Indian military aviation this week. Take a look at what this helicopter is all about. The view from a helicopter cockpit flying between the world's highest landing grounds. The forbidding desolate heights of the Siachen Glacier. Where the air is thin, the temperatures well below zero. And where survival is a daily struggle. But the helicopter from which the video has been shot is not even in service yet. It's called the Light Utility Helicopter, developed by Hindustan Aeronautics Limited. It is currently under a final phase of testing and certification by the Indian Army and Air Force. This indigenous helicopter with a high rate of production planned will be churned out from ATL's Bengaluru Rotocraft facility to replace in-service Chetak and Cheetah helicopters that form a crucial logistic element in India's high altitude deployments. A requirement of nearly 200 of the LUH has been laid down. But a firm order has still not been placed. Continuing accidents and fatalities on the Cheetah and Cheetah fleet has not added urgency to the LUH program. With a crew of two and capacity to carry six passengers, the LUH is purpose-built for high-altitude operations. The two-ton light helicopter can be modified from a basic cargo utility chopper to being able to deliver small special forces teams to forward locations. To a mini air ambulance or even a light gunship. Of a requirement of about 400 light military helicopters, this indigenous chopper will fulfill the need for half. The other half, theoretically, is to be met by the Russian K8226T. That is to be built by India and Russia jointly. But with the latter deal going nowhere, critics of arms imports believe it's time to pour all resources and precious budgets into the Indian LUH. Most importantly, it's an Indian machine, developed, designed and manufactured in India by Indian engineers. The military will never have to face spare issues with an Indian helicopter. The helicopter, a derivative of the in-service and venerable Dhruv helicopter, will also be easily upgradable. And as per the military's future needs. All this creates a strong case for the LUH to be India's sole future light utility helicopter. Whether or not India can pull back from the Russian deal is another story and may have its own political compulsion. But the LUH has proven that it is mature, capable and nearly ready to meet the Indian military's crucial helicopter requirements in the mountains and anywhere else they need to be deployed. India has sent three teams of NDRF, that is the National Disaster Response Force for Search and Rescue Operations in Quake Hit Turkey. India today's God of Savant caught up with one team in Turkey's Nuradgi, one of the worst affected zones. He sent us this report. Rescue operations continue in Turkey and uh, at Nurdagi with us is Tomris. Uh, Tomris, um, what can you tell us about the operations that are happening here? 
Actually, uh, also our uh, Turkish uh, people are very sad because uh, 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 nearly 10 uh, cities they um, actually hide and sink. Yeah. Uh, so we are very uh, ha uh, sad. Uh, and I am. Uh, thank you for uh, Turkish people, uh, Indian people, uh, because we are helping for me. And this is place is the uh, you see <laughs> very bad and uh, nearly uh, 20,000 uh, died people uh, in Turkey year two. So very sadness and. Uh, thank you for all helping all ter all world and uh, extra Indian people is uh, thank you. And we're taking you straight to Mumbai for images coming in live of Prime Minister Modi interacting with the Bori community, inaugurating the education campus of the Daudi Bora community. These are live images coming in. The Prime Minister was there to flag off the latest Vande Bharat train, and here is the Prime Minister with the. Bori community in Mumbai. He has just inaugurated a brand new education campus of the Daudi Bora community as well. Let's listen. Chautha campus or Pradhan Mantri Bora Samudaya ke sarvoch neta Sayyid Nama Fawadil Saifuddin ke saath milte huye unse baat chit karte huye. बेहद आत्मीय ये दृश्य जब प्रधानमंत्री बोहरा समुदाय के सर्वोच्च नेता के साथ मिले प्रधानमंत्री ने इस परिसर का निरीक्षण भी किया और वहां पर गणमान्य लोगों के साथ प्रधानमंत्री ने बातचीत भी की और ये दृश्य उस वक्त के हैं जब बोहरा समुदाय के सर्वोच्च नेता सैदना मुफतल सैफुद्दीन के साथ प्रधानमंत्री ने मुलाकात की बेहद आत्मीय ये दृश्य दिखाई दे रहे हैं ये भव्य संस्थान अलजामिया तो सैफिया अरबी अकादमी का चौथा कैंपस है प्रधानमंत्री ने आज इस नए परिसर का उद्घाटन किया Inaugurating the Mumbai campus of the Al Jamia to Sefia Arabic Academy located in Andheri's Marol area. Uh, Sayedna Mufadal Saifud in the 53rd Aldai Al Mutlaq and head of the Daudi Bora community is the man you see there with the Prime Minister hosting him and escorting him. This will be the fourth campus, uh, also known as Jamea, that is being inaugurated in this fashion. Let's go straight across to India today's uh, Mustafa Sheikh for more. Uh, Mustafa, the inauguration of this Dawoodi Bora community's education campus. Uh, give us the significance of these images that we're bringing in live, Mustafa. Well, this uh, campus uh, is of an Arabic university uh, belonging to Dawoodi Bora community and it is in Marol, Andheri East area. It's a huge campus which has been inaugurated with students and teachers uh, uh, facilities and recognition by the government. Prime Minister Narendra Modi is known to have close ties with this particular uh, Bora community and the, he shares a long history since the time he was Chief Minister of Gujarat. He has had chaired and attended many of the events of uh, this community and hence this is an important uh, day for the community uh, that the Prime Minister himself has come for this uh, inauguration and you can see that there are large numbers uh, the people from the community are present and he was uh, welcomed with a band, uh, a, a, a traditional band which was played by this community while he was entering that university and uh, this inauguration of this university will be important and will have uh, advantages for the uh, Bori community and their future education. Back to you. Okay, Mustafa, thanks very much. Uh, great images there. The Prime Minister just wrapping up that visit with the Daudi Bora community, inaugurating that very, very symbolic as well. Thanks. We will continue to bring you these images through the day today. Stay with us.
is perhaps India's most popular soldier general. He was the core commander in charge of Kashmir, including the Kashmir Valley, when the Pulwama terror attack happened. And his memoir is now one of the most anticipated books that's about to be published. It's called Kitne Gazi Aaye, Kitne Gazi Gaye. And Lieutenant General KJS Dhillon, better known as Tiny Dhillon, to all his millions of admirers in India around the world, is here with us for that first detailed interview ahead of the publication of his book, as well as to talk about some of the big things facing us as a nation today. General Dillon, always a pleasure. Good to see you here on India Today. Thank you for your time, sir. First of all, congratulations on your upcoming book. We're all looking forward to it very greatly. But I want to start with something that is not only your passion, but something that the entire country is seeing right now, sir, which is the Turkey earthquake. And once again, it is the Indian army that is helping over there. Uh, in the common Indian's mind, there is a perception that no matter what the problem, the Indian army is called in to help. What is it about the Indian army, sir, you know, having, having led large numbers of men and women uh, over your career, what is it about the Indian army that they have such an amazing reputation, not just here in India, but also abroad in the worst situations? Uh, thank you, Shiv. And uh, first of all, uh, good day to all of viewers. Indian Army, the ethos, the culture, the upbringing, the mentoring, the training, the chiseling, I can continue yeah. saying these words, is something which is beyond explainable words. It's a phenomenon. I served Indian Army, if I include my NDA and IMA training, mm. 43 years. Never in these 43 years I ever had this feeling that job can take a second seat. Yeah. I written in the book which you mentioned, I was not home when both my children were born. I was not there when they were, went to school, when they did their schooling, completed their schooling, when they went to professional colleges. So Indian Army is judged by a to ahsasana, and they are a very people friendly army. Even in situations in Northeast and in Kashmir, you covered yeah. them so extensively. The people there, in spite of all the propaganda, they say, Sab army ki post mm -hmm. laga mm -hmm. They feel very secure, they feel very safe when there is an army yeah. close by. And then, again, we are an army of India. India is a very diverse nation. We are a very diverse army. We do our job properly and you talked about Turkey. Mm. In spite of whatever the diplomacy or whatever the states uh, have been doing in the past, when there is a job to do, the humanitarian aid, Turkish citizens have to be saved, Indian Army contingent, the medic... And the Army was off yes. instantly. I, 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 there was no time wasted at all. Yes, I tweeted about it. Yeah. I said, Indian government decides, yeah. ADGPI is moving. Yeah. So this is how it works. And a nation of our size, the army of our size, the military might. Mm. We have to be prepared for all contingencies at all times. Yeah. Only country in the world with two nuclear neighbors and both not very friendly to you. Yeah. So we have to keep our powder dry all the while and out of area contingencies, humanitarian aid contingencies, any counter terrorist contingency or mm. you know, sub-conventional convention. Yeah. We need to be every time ready for everything. Yeah. How much energy does it take, General, to keep the powder dry at all times? You know, bahar se it looks very easy. Uh, you have to be ready at all times. But it must, there must be a cost and an energy expenditure to constantly be combat ready, constantly be prepared to fly at a moment's notice, no matter where the problem is in the world. See, Indian Defence Forces, Army, Navy, Air Force, all together, as also the paramilitary forces, maybe ITBP, BSF, CRPF, who are supporting the defense forces yeah. during peace as well as during war. They have to be ready all the time for all the contingencies, like I said earlier, and keeping the powder dry is easier said than done. Yeah. Yeah. They are very specialist weapon systems, they are very specialist ammunition. Yeah, right. Those ammunition have shelf lives. Those ammunition have storage requirements of maintenance of particular temperatures. Those ammunition have problems of carriage. You cannot carry them in a particular type of a transport system. Those ammunition will have to be replenished. They have right. to be turned over. Their life has to be checked every now and mm -hmm. then. Mm -hmm. So it's a very complicated and complex system which various wings of the army 
same is true for Navy and Air Force, who are continuously on the job, yeah. keeping your men in shape, keeping your fleet in shape, keeping your heavy equipment in shape, keeping your ammunition ready and replenished, and obsolete ammunition disposal. It right. happens in a very, very complex, but in a very synthesized manner. Yeah, yeah. And it's, it's, a, it's a major oppression. I'm sure you are aware of it. Absolutely. But our countrymen, I think it's enough to say the lot which goes into it. Yeah. And, and, you know, the work speaks for itself. Nobody needs to, uh, you know, uh, shout about it. The fact is the army quietly does its work, and that's the most amazing thing about it. General, now coming to a topic that's, that's very close to you, but has have been one of the most troubling episodes in our country, which is the Pulwama terror attack. Your book comes out on the fourth anniversary of the Pulwama terror attack. Reading your book, one comes to know that you had just taken over the, uh, the, the Chinar Corps in Srinagar when the terror attack had happened. So, in, 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 in more ways than one, the Pulwama terror attack was your trial by fire. You were thrust straight into a nightmare as soon as you had taken charge. You had experience in Kashmir, but this was the, probably the maximum level trial by fire that could happen. Take us through what happened that day, sir. Like, you were there, just four days old in that position. What happened? Like you said, I took over the responsibility of the command of Chinar Corps on 10th of February yeah. 2019. I had multiple tenures yes. earlier. I have been there since Captain Days of 1988. I have seen yeah. 19th of January, so with 1990 yeah. and everything. I have seen Kashmiri Pandit Exodus. I have seen a number of operations before that. And 10th of February, I take over. 14th February, an attack of the magnitude of where we lost 40 Bravehearts of mm -hmm. CRPF. This type of attack had not happened in Kashmir terrorism history earlier with so much of damage. Yes, it took time for us to understand the magnitude of the damage. Yes. But there was no time to be lost. We got down to work straight away. Immediately. Mm. We immediately, like I'll give you a small anecdote I wrote in the book also, when I was traveling for a meeting, my ADC, Captain Sandeep Singh, mm. naturally young officer, yeah. he was also following up the uh, thing, this is 14 February evening, and he asked me in the vehicle, he said, sir, ab kya hoga? Again, pardon my language, I said, we will get the bastards. Mm -hmm. Now that is the time we need to recompose ourselves, get our composer together, get our yeah. act together, and then we got down to it. Yeah. Within 48 hours, we got the intelligence, yeah. we struck, and less than 100 hours, we eliminated that module. Yeah. The commander of that module was the code word Ghazi Kamran. Yeah. And this is how Kitne Ghazi I... Of your book. And everyone remembers that, uh, you know, that press conference as well. Uh, it is, it is, uh, it must have been a source of amazing pride to take over the Kashmir core. Uh, after having served in, the, in, in Kashmir, such a beautiful place, uh, you know, and, and I, I'm sure you would join me in, in you know, recommending to all, all those watching that they must go and spend some time in Kashmir. It's a part of our great country. Lovely, lovely place. But being there as a soldier is a different experience altogether, sir, because there you are not, there it's not a holiday, it's not a picnic. Uh, you know, any day could be your last. So I want to know, since having, having served on, you know, on the frontiers and the line of control, high altitude areas, etc., uh, you know, death is always possibly around just the corner. You've touched upon some of the instances in your book. Uh, I want to know from you, what is your most, most telling memory of a close brush? A close brush where you thought this is it. This is the end now. This happened... Uh, the reason the I'm asking is because most young people want to know that from those uh -huh. who've served. See, uh, this happened, although I had more tenures in Kashmir, yeah. I had number of encounters in Kashmir where I was personally involved. But this particular incident which you are referring to, yeah. the closest brush happened in Manipur. Right. I was posted as a major in Rashtra Rifles in Manipur. And uh, this was July of uh, 2000, uh, uh, July of, oh yeah, July of 98, mm. July of 98. And we got information at 11 in the night that in a particular village there are 40 insurgents with the machine guns and all. Right. My commanding officer gave this information and he also told me, Tani, lagta nahi hai sahi hai. this is too huge a number. Mm. I said, no sir, this particular village is a known place. It has acted as a training camp for the terrorist uh, insurgents earlier. So this information is correct. It was on a pinnacle of yeah. a hillock. So I said, I will hit with a small team of 10 people. I will hit the village. The insurgents will run down. So we will have strong ambushes at the base. Right. 
and I put 20 men each at four or five places. And I, with a small team, hit that village. It was raining the whole night. We walked for four hours. And early morning, as you are aware, uh, in northeast, the sun rises early. Yes. It was around 4.35, and sun was just coming out. And as I was approaching the village, from the top, the sergeant opened up with a machine gun and a grenade launcher. So while and you were climbing up? While I was climbing up, and okay. uh, I looked into his eyes. He looked into my eyes. It was just for 30, 40 meters. And these bullets were not hitting me. Mm -hmm. There's something called plunging fire. Right. When you fire downhill, the gravity takes the bullets away from the a point of hit. Right. Right. I explained this and this. Yes. And imagine you are looking into his eyes, he's looking into your eyes, and he's firing at you, and you are not getting hit. Right. <laughs> and that is when I called for the two inch motor, because I knew I also won't be able to hit him, mm -hmm. in spite of having. Uh, because seen. he has the advantage. Obviously. He has the advantage. So we got the two inch motor, Naik Krishipal, he ran up to me. And uh, we then fired, and then that operation continued for three days. And again, I had close brushes in that operation. But beautiful thing is, next day morning, we were out of communication the whole day. Yeah. Next day, we were chasing this terrorist, and next day, in the, I got into a place where I could communicate. So first thing, my headquarters asked me, is everything OK? Is everything OK? So I said, after giving the report, I told them, I said, there's a boy whose wife is in hospital. Please check and let me know what is the condition. Mm. So this is how we, and then second yeah. thing was, I said, my wife's birthday is coming after a few days. I may or may not return, please be sure. <laughs> so this is yeah. keeping your senses alive, yeah. Yeah. keeping your human angle, yeah. humanitarian aspects of soldiers. This is, uh, the human, humanitarian aspect of the soldier is another thing that is, you know, very, very commonly portrayed in the public sphere. You know, the buddy system, yes. soldiers together, camaraderie in the, in the forces. But most people, you know, they, they, they see it, they applaud it, general, but... I don't think people understand it as a soldier and a general can. Explain that to us. You know, the, the, the capacity of people like you to put your life in your soldier's hands, your soldier to put his life in your hands. How does that work? And, in, you know, explain that with a situation where, you know, two men or a group of men have actually realized that my life is in another person's hands. Shiv, uh, it is like this. Soldier, by appearance, looks a very tough man, yeah. very burly face, twirling moustaches, yeah. and a big smart gun. But inside, he is a very, very nice, simple human being. Mm. He has a family, he has his fears, he has his parents, People he has like his us. children, yeah. everyone. Yeah. We come or from, the, like me, yeah, yeah. We come from yeah. the same society. Yeah. Yeah. But there comes a time when we leave apart all these things, and then we only look at our job, yeah. job at hand. And coming to buddy system, and buddy system is there are 10 boys in a bunker. Mm. One man, a buddy pair is standing guard outside, one on the say, northern side, one on the western side. It's breezy, it's snowing, it's chillingly cold. Now this man is giving the duty. Yeah. Something called imandari, wafadari, zimedari. Right. Imandari and wafadari we all understand. Yes. Zimedari is something with which this man is standing guard. Mm. 10 people are sleeping inside. Yeah, yeah. And he is zimedar for the safety of this 10 men. Yeah, no compromise. He no compromise. And why no compromise? Now he is standing there, fan me fires or terrorist fire. Mm -hmm. He will save this 10 men. Yeah. But after two hours, he will go inside and sleep. Yeah. Somebody else will come out and stand guard. Mm -hmm. And then it is his right. So, zimedari is in our DNA. Yeah. We can never let down yeah. our buddy because it is not that we are letting down. It is next moment he may be letting you down. Yeah. So it is an unwritten law. Right. Nobody leaves the body. We don't even leave our dead behind. Yes. So those are ethos of Indian Army. He has embraced social media in a, in a very, very open manner. He talks to his, uh, his audience. He's constantly answering their questions. Uh, he's, uh, you know, always uh, says thank you to compliments from no matter where they come from. And I'm, I'm guessing you get them all day, sir. But, you know, social media is also a very serious business. And you've seen the the flip side of social media as the Kashmir commander, I'm sure. So I wanted to know about your experience with that because we've seen how terror groups have used social media for recruitment, for propaganda, for their own, you know, sinister purposes, especially in the Kashmir Valley, sir. How did you handle all of that? Because your understanding of social media is amazing. So how did you handle the flip side of social media by terror groups? Pakistan has a narrative, has a propaganda. Yeah. And he uses social media to spread that propaganda mm. and spread that narrative. If we do not portray our part yeah. or our point of view, and most importantly, in a transparent manner, in an ethical manner, mm. in a truthful mm. manner, 
there is no bigger propaganda than yeah. being truthful. There is no bigger propaganda than being transparent. So finally, the lies will come out. Mm. There was a Prime Minister of Pakistan who tweeted the wrong photographs. Correct, correct, correct. So he got caught. But if you are truthful, and my point when managing social media is managing of perceptions of young minds. Mm. If I am not honest in my say, social media content, yeah. if I am not transparent, if I don't respond to questions, but only thing I always tell, I mean, yesterday also I tweeted, I said we can discuss, let's not argue, mm. Mm. let's not be abusive, mm. we can convey your point of view very firmly without yeah. being abusive. I've seen on social media friends of years are blocking each other. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So social media by definition, media is a platform yeah. or a sort of a medium given to you to interact socially. Yeah. So it's a social interaction platform. But did it ever did it ever pose a challenge for you, sir? Did you ever think that you know how does one tackle this challenge where you have uh, you know inimical elements, anti-national elements, terror groups using these same platforms that are otherwise beneficial to society to go against the country, go against the army? Was how big a challenge was that? Yeah, it's a challenge because Pakistan social media management or the yeah. perception management or the narrative building. Yes. They do it in a very, very systematic manner. Yes, way. absolutely. To, to counter it, you have to pick up their content. Mm. You have to say this is wrong and you have to counter them with facts. Making a mere statement that this video by Pakistan is a propaganda yeah. will not help. It will probably also have doubt on your credibility. Mm. Mm. But if I give the corroboration, if I give the origin of that video, and mm. if I give why this video is not what it is being yeah. portrayed, yeah. then my credibility goes up. Yeah. So it is not important to, you know, sort of give a rebuttal immediately. You must counter it with facts, figures. Yes. Like uh, some small thing like when did the terrorism begin in Kashmir? In my book I written, I said 19th January 1990 was a date. Yes. yes. A very serious date, very black day. Mm. But the terrorism started much earlier. Yeah. People are not ready to talk about it because mm. it doesn't suit their constituency. Right. And there are so many narratives. There are so many narratives. Yeah, yeah. Narratives within narratives. Yeah. Oh, and speaking of narratives, sir, um, I know for a fact that soldier generals like General Dillon like to keep away from politics. So I'm not going to touch upon politics at all. But to frame my question, I'd like to say that there has been a lot of politics over how safe is Kashmir right now. Recently, we saw the Bharat Jodo Yatra over there. Then we saw a huge Tutu Meme happen in Parliament, where, where one side said, we went there, it's not safe. The other side said, you walk there, it's totally safe. You proved our point. My, my personal sense is that the common average Indian would, would more readily believe a soldier who has served there than anyone else, perhaps. Uh, so I want, I, I want your view, sir, of what Kashmir is like right now, especially after the abrogation of Article 370 and especially at now, because I'm sure you visited recently as well. How much has it changed? How safe is it? What is, what is the status? Shiva, again, I will base my argument or my logic on facts and figures. Yeah. There are indices which, which will give you how, what is the level of terrorism? Mm. Firstly, how many terrorist initiated incidents are happening? How many local boys are joining the terrorist team? Yes. How many actions of terrorists and the civilians are getting killed? How many security forces personnel are getting killed? How much infiltration is happening? So all these indices combined together mm. Mm. are pointers about the situation. Then tourism. How many tourists are coming in? Hotel bookings. All these are the indices. Yes. And I dare say, all these indices are down yeah. compared to any time, year on year or a quarter on quarter. Tourism or is up, but everything else is, else is down. Yeah, I'm saying in the, you can weigh it at the way you want it. Yeah, yeah. So every index is in the favor of peace. Mm. Mm. So I will not make a yeah. you know, statement without facts. Right. They are very favorable facts. So you are saying we don't need to be subjective. The data yeah, proves data, that data, proves, data speaks. Mm. The data speaks for itself. Yeah, yeah. So Kashmir is a much safer and peaceful place yes. as compared to any time prior to today. You can have a yeah. year on year or like I said quarter on quarter or whatever. Yeah. Yeah. And it is improving further. Yeah. And why it is improving is very important. Yeah. The common Kashmiri, the Awam, they have tasted the dividends of peace. Right. When the tourism goes up, when the peace goes up, when the shop is Prosperity. open till 8 o'clock, he's earning more, he's got more job creation, schools are open, children are getting educated, right. there is a better prospect for the future children, the future of children. Yeah. So when he tasted all these dividends of peace, now he doesn't want to go back to right. the black days. Yes. 
So it is the yearning of the local Kashmiri which is forcing even Pakistan to stop this nonsense. Yeah, absolutely. And that is why Kashmir's peace journey is now irrevocable. It's irrevocable, yes, absolutely. But things are still sensitive and uh, you know, I hope that things don't move into a reverse gear. Uh, uh, believe me when I say that Kashmir is one of the most beautiful places, not just in India but the world. And I encourage our viewers to plan your holidays there. Don't constantly think about going abroad. Go and spend a winter in Kashmir. You will be thanking me. Trust me. My final question to you to come back once again to Kashmir, uh, General, and once again to some, you know, something that you've spoken about in your book is Pulwama. And sadly, most often the Indian public hears about Kashmir when soldiers or officers are killed in action in an encounter like Pulwama or any other terror attack or encounter that's when it happens you as a as a as a you know a, a core commander have had to make those difficult phone calls even previously to families of men under your charge who may have lost their lives in operations I want to know th about that sir how difficult is that because you have to break the news to a, either a wife, next of kin, parents who mi might not be very old about losing their loved one. Tell us about that process. How difficult is that? Most difficult job in a commander's uh, service career is to salute your comrades for the one last time and lay the wreath. This particular press conference and this photograph on the cover of the book happened after I had laid the wreath on the mortal remains of Major Vibhuti Dondial and the soldiers who got killed in action during the Pinglana operation yes. where we eliminated Ghazi. Straight from the war memorial, I came to the press conference. And a lot of people say there is a lot of anger in your eyes. It is not without reason. So coming back to your question, most difficult job in a commander's life is to pay the homage or lay the wreath and again the most difficult thing is to call up someone and say I'm sorry to inform you this is what has happened to your son or the and here I would like to say our wives, army wives, army parents they are the strongest people on this planet yeah, true. my wife has heard my death news or seen my death news on the TV twice yeah. I mentioned once mm. when she was eight months pregnant yes. But she held herself together for the same wafadari, imandari, zimedari, wafadari. She did not want to show herself as a shattered person. So our families are also very strong. And somewhere at the back of their mind, every time the phone rings, the heartbeat goes up. Absolutely. Absolutely. And they are expecting probably the worst news, yes. especially once we are posted in such areas. But they hold the fort together so the soldier can do his duty. Yes without having to look back or be bothered about his home front. So I think we have a wonderful companionship here and every soldier I can talk about. On that, on that uh, you know, very sobering note and a reminder to all of us as citizens is, uh, you know, perhaps to, uh, uh, you know, make a country that's worth protecting. It's not a proverb or a cliche because, uh, so, you know, we cannot unfortunately meet all of our soldiers and thank them personally, but we can be good Indian citizens and make a country that's worth protecting. And as the general said, military families are truly made of something else. So our salute not just to soldiers and generals, but also to those families. And what better tribute could there be to those who were lost in Pulwama and other terror attacks than a book that pays tribute as well as remembers and talks about everything and has a forward-looking perspective on how the country has changed, is changing and will be changing in the days ahead. General Dillon, thank you very much. Thank a pleasure you. and an honor. Thank you for speaking to India. Thank you.